Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. Braving the braving the the weather. Yes, you see, I'm all bundled up. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, um, you know, I like to start these out like for anyone watching this who may not know who you are. Um, maybe you could kind of introduce yourself. Okay. Well, I'm Don Hosterman. Uh, Make names Freeman. I was actually married to Tommy Morrison from 1996 until 2000. So, uh, I don't know what else you want me to say about that. <laughs> well, let's talk about like maybe when you first met him the very first time. Do you remember kind of what year that was? Uh, yes, I do. I was actually 14 years old. Um, I would have been a freshman in high school. And I, just, I remember hearing his name when I was in eighth grade, but I didn't actually meet him until I went into high school. And that would have been in 1986. Now, why were you hearing his name? Was it because he was popular in Jay at the time? Or? Um, actually, I remember hearing his name from a friend of mine. We used to ride the bus together, and she's a little bit older than me, and she actually had a crush on him. So <laughs> I got to hear about Tommy Morrison from her. So. And then when, when you first met him, what was that like? Um, well, I think it was actually we had a student union at our school. It was just a, a building for the high school kids to go to, to at lunchtime to play pool, have lunch. We had soda machines and a jukebox and things like that in there. And uh, I was sitting at a table with some friends and he actually came in and came and sat next to one of my friends. Uh, and uh, that's the first time I actually remember meeting him. And uh, how long was it before you, you, the two of you kind of like started talking regularly? Um, not long after that, I remember actually, it's kind of a funny story. I was walking through the high school, one of the halls, and one of his friends came up to me and handed me a note and just said, no one's supposed to know about this, and just handed me the note and walked off. Well, I went to my computer class and read the note, and it was nothing, nothing terrible. It was just, hey, I think you're pretty like to get to know you and um, some friends around me saw the note and Tom actually had a girlfriend at the time imagine that and it got back to her that he had written this note to me well she actually called me that night and asked me about it and of course I was honest it's like yeah he wrote me a note and um, she said well can I have it I'm like sure I guess so you know <laughs> He was dating another girl, so um, anyway, I gave her the note, and uh, he got in a little bit of trouble over that, but um, it was probably about another year before we actually went out on a date. I was a sophomore in high school when that happened. And he was already boxing at the time? Um, not professionally, because he, he was still in school at that time. He was just a couple of grades ahead of me. So when I was a sophomore in high school, he was a senior. So I know he had been boxing, but not professionally at that point. And when you first started seeing him, I mean, I remember you were talking a little bit about this at Circle Cinema, but what were your impressions of him at that time? Um, well, I was pretty intimidated by him. Uh, I mean, I, he was a nice guy, he was good looking, but uh, I was actually quite shy in high school and um, just. Oh, I think. Me a reason to be, but uh, just, and I knew he had other girlfriends like I knew a lot of girls liked him and so I was always just kind of standoffish when it came to him and here comes my daughter I need to go back to the room. Hi. 
Yeah. We'll go ask Bubba. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> go ask Bubba. Hey, you're not dressed. Go ask Bubba. <laughs> this is Haley. Here, go ask Bubba to help you. He won't help me. He won't help me. Haley, go. He won't help me. Sorry. <laughs> hey, go ask him. He will help you. Go. Sorry. No, that's quite all right. Um, <laughs> are you okay to continue? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Go ask your brother to help you. He will help you. He's a good Bubba. Go. So, you know, when you were uh, with Tom at that time, you were saying how you were kind of like intimidated by him, but why did you decide to see him anyway? <laughs> well, um, that's kind of hard to answer. Uh, well, we didn't date a whole lot in high school. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many dates we went on, but um, that didn't last very long, probably because I was so shy and intimidated by him that uh, we dated again when I was a senior in high school, and he was living in Kansas City at the time. But um, we just always were friends and he had a good relationship with my parents. And so, you know, he was around. Um, so I don't know. Can't really answer that. <laughs> so when we were watching the documentary, you know, it, it talked a lot about his parents. Um, what do you recall of his parents? I mean, the, the times that you're around them. Um, well, his mom is, uh, you know, she was always pretty protective of Tom, but she, I mean, she was always kind to me. And uh, his dad, I really, really didn't spend much time around his dad. So, you know, Tom had told me a lot of stories about his dad and how he grew up and everything, but I really never spent much time around him. So. Yeah, it seemed like Tony was reluctant to talk about his father. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say anything to hurt anybody's feelings, but right. his dad was just someone that I did not want to be around. So, and he had brothers too, right? Yes. Um, from his, you know, from Tim and Diane's marriage, there was Timmy, Tanya and Tom, Timmy's oldest brother. And, uh, he and I actually, he actually called me not too long ago. And so we spoke on the phone for a while, but, uh, so he had Timmy and Tanya as siblings. And then, uh, he has another brother from his mom's side of the family. And, uh, his name is escaping me right now, but I have met him before. And they were boxers too. So they were kind of maybe not exactly like Tom personality wise, perhaps, but kind of yes. in the same circle, so to speak, as far as competitive. And Tom has younger brothers, too. There's, uh, they live in Missouri, and uh, they're quite a bit younger than Tom. So there's a set of twins and another brother. So he does have several siblings. And do you, do you stay in touch with all of those people? Or? Um, most of them I do. I'm actually friends with a lot of them on Facebook. Um, not big on talking to people on the phone as my daughter introduced herself here. That's why. <laughs> so I do keep in touch with them just via Facebook. So let's kind of talk about, you know, as he starts competing, when were you kind of with him? Do you remember like how old you were when you were kind of with him when he was competing? Well, when I was still in high school, he had started boxing professionally. And like I said, my dad, they were friends. And so, you know, my dad was a big boxing fan. So we would go to Tom's fights, you know, when he would fight in Kansas City. And um, so, you know, I would hang out with Tom after those fights as well. So, um, but I really didn't realize how um, 
I guess, not really famous he was becoming, but uh, when he fought Foreman, he had invited me to come out to watch him fight Foreman. And uh, my mom went with me and one of my high school friends and my older brother Rick met us out there. And I remember we got to the hotel and called his room to let him know we were there. Well, he comes down to the lobby and people just flocked to him. People came out of nowhere, just coming up to him, asking for autographs. And I was in shock. I was like, you know, it's just Tom. <laughs> what do all these people want? So anyway, um, that's when, you know, I started realizing, hey, this is, this is a pretty big deal. But um, so that would have been in 93, June of 93. And that's when our relationship really got serious. And, uh, but a lot of people, you know, they didn't know that we were talking all this time. We talked quite a bit while he was actually training for that fight when he was at BMI. And um, so he would call me a lot. We spent many hours on the phone. He would send me cards and letters. And so that's really where our relationship, you know, got serious. And <clears throat> kind of tell me, because that's the first time you go to see him fight in that kind of bigger atmosphere, right? You had seen him at other fights before, though? Right, yes. So kind of give me some of, like, your impressions of – that was in Vegas, right? It was in Vegas. Uh, it was pretty wild. I mean, you know, he gave us ringside seats, so we were down there with – you know, there were a ton of celebrities there. And um, so, you know, I got to see um, John Cusack was there, of course, Tom and Roseanne Arnold, and uh, just several celebrities were there. So it was just a really big deal. And, um, you know, we watched the fight. I actually got to go back to the dressing room before the fight and, you know, give him a hug and wish him luck. And, uh, after the fight, kind of a funny story, he was still in the ring, you know, talking to the announcers. They were interviewing him. And I was just standing out, you know, just watching, just kind of in awe of all that was going on. And he kept looking over at me and kind of like, you know, doing his head like this. And of course, I'm just oblivious, like, you know, just ob oblivious to what's going on. Well, he finally comes down from the ring and tells me, he's like, you were standing next to MC Hammer. I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Had no idea. <laughs> so, so. He was trying to get was, you to introduce yourself to him. Yeah, like, hey, MC Hammer standing next to you. Had no clue. Absolutely no clue. Yeah, I mean, I could see how that would be. You were kind of in kind of a blur because he won the heavyweight championship that night. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, so uh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so after that, you know, we're walking out. I left with him and um, we go out to get in the limo and I crawl in the limo and I sit down and I look and Mickey Rourke is sitting across from me. And I'm just like, holy crap, that's Mickey Rourke. So that was pretty cool. It is kind of. I love you too. Go back. Uh, she can hang out kind of, uh, She'll take over. <laughs> it's kind of interesting how when they're having success as boxers and celebrities are kind of around. Yes. Um, yeah. And Mickey's a fighter too. So, so that was pretty cool. Now, what was – I'm trying to kind of get your first-hand impressions of like, okay, you're, you're at that experience. You go to the event after – what is that like? Well, it just are you kind of asking about my impressions with Tom and just everything that was going that on? Transpired after the, maybe that night or the next morning. Yeah. So after the fight, you know, we went to the, the after party and of course there's celebrities there. And I actually have a picture that someone took of Tom and I sitting there. And I'm just, I remember thinking, you know, this guy has all of these people wanting his attention. And here he is sitting here with me, this little girl from Jay, Oklahoma. You know, he could have anybody he wanted, you know, 
why me? Why is he sitting here with me? So I remember thinking that. Um, but then, you know, after the party, we actually went, uh, I went to his hotel room with him and uh, no funny stuff happened. I promise. He was the one guy that never tried anything on me. Um, but he was just beat up and worn out. So we really just kind of laid there and talked and uh, he ended up a little bit later going out with some of his friends and I just crashed. But um, my my mom and I and my friend, we left the next day to come back to Oklahoma. And um, I think he stayed out there for a few days, but he ended up coming to Jay not long after that. So of course we hung out and you know, the rest is history, so. It was just, like I said, just kind of wild because he's always just been Tom to me and, you know, just to see how people reacted to him was just kind of crazy. Right. Now, what year was it when you actually married him? Uh, 96. So from that point, now you're with him off, like, all the time, right? I mean, when he's not training, obviously. Right. So... You know, after he fought Foreman, he he stayed in Kansas City, I think, for about another year. And um, he would fly me out to Kansas City to see him often. Uh, if he was training for a fight, he would send me, you know, fly me out to wherever he was training. And um, just to see him and hang out with him. So he actually, I think it was 94. Um he called me and he was ready to move back to Oklahoma. So he had me reach out to Janice Elder, who is Eric Elder's mother, and she's a realtor here, and told me to find us a house. So um, she took me around, showed me a, a ton of elaborate houses on Grand Lake, you know, and just, mm. you know, could have picked any house I wanted. And, um, she took me out to this house out by Southwest City, Missouri. And when we pulled up in the driveway, I was like, I think this is going to be the one. You know, it's out in the country. It had 100 acres. And it was just a beautiful cedar house. And I walked in the front door, and I was like, this is it. So um, I called Tom, and I was like, I think I found our house. And he ended up flying in and, you know, felt the same way. So... He bought that house, and we lived there from 94 until 1998. Now, you know, obviously he had a reputation. You know, <clears throat> did you see him coming and going a lot or stuff like that? Um, you mean like... I know you talked about at Circle Cinema, for example, you talked about when you are with him. Um, but sometimes you didn't know where he was or... Uh, yeah. So. Um, well, t I usually knew where he was, you know, up until about 1998 when things started going downhill. That is when I didn't know, you know, he would disappear for days and I wouldn't know where he was. But that was when, you know, he was going downhill and getting into things that he shouldn't have been doing. So now, <clears throat> so let's go back. He beats Foreman. What was the mm -hmm. next fight? Was it, was it Mercer or? <clears throat> no, uh, Mercer would have been way before that. Um, um, we, weren't, we weren't actually together when he fought Mercer. But um, after Foreman is when he fought Michael Bent in October oh. of 93 in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I remember. A, that was a rough night. <laughs> well, let's talk about just that because the event itself was a big deal, as Tony was saying. And I remember, I think I was in high school at the time. <clears throat> and uh, for Tulsa, it was a huge deal. It was time. a big deal, yeah. So did you have, were you going to some press conferences and things like that for that? or? Um, I did not. I was actually home in Jay and... Um, I didn't come up to Tulsa until I think the day before the fight uh -huh. uh, came up and stayed with him at the hotel and um, trying to remember so long ago. Um, 
you know, just hung out with him the day of the fight. So. You said you went to see a country singer or something? We did. We actually went to see George Strait. Clay Walker opened up for him. This was back when uh, Clay Walker was just starting out. So we actually got to meet Clay Walker and George Strait, which was freaking awesome. Um, <laughs> Clay Walker was so excited to meet Tom. It was really funny because he was just like a little kid in a candy store, just like thrilled to meet Tom. And uh, so we actually got to go on George Strait's bus. And of course, I'm the first one walking on the bus. And there's a guy sitting there just looking at me. And it takes me a minute because he doesn't have his cowboy hat on. And I was like, oh, my God, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, got to meet George. We sat on his bus for a while. And um, he and Tom talked boxing. And Tom signed some wow. boxing gloves for his son. Go back to your brother's room, please. I can't. Your brother can. Bubba will do it. So, um, you know, there was there was a not very long. Please go. Go. Sorry, guys. No, it's so, okay. Um, Bubba will get you something to drink. There you go. Take it. So um, there was a rumor going around that Tom was out drinking that night before the fight, and uh, that is definitely not true. Uh, he did not drink at the concert, and after the concert, we went back to the hotel and went to bed, and I kind of joked about it. It's like if he went out drinking, he's pretty sneaky, but uh, he was sneaky, but he wasn't that sneaky. And actually what happened there, I found out later, he had a friend, and I won't mention the guy's name because I just will let that go. But he was um, he was kind of Tom's, I wouldn't say assistant, but one of his buddies that he took with him everywhere. And he started dressing like Tom, shaving like Tom, got his ear pierced like Tom. And he actually kind of resembled him a little bit and he was out in Tulsa that night in the bars telling people he was Tommy Morrison so you know people think oh yeah he's out in the bar drinking before the fight so that's where that rumor actually came from yeah and I saw you know Henry Primo was at the Circle Cinema I think it was he said you guys had dinner with him or something um I didn't but Tom did yeah I think Tom and Tony went to his house yeah, I think most people, like I was telling my wife, these people are like Tulsa fixtures, so to speak. Henry Primo, Al Jurgens. There were oh, several yeah. people there that, you know, the average yeah. person would know who they were. But I had seen Henry Primo on his car commercials. All oh, the, yeah. That was a nice store. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. He, Sam's <laughs> is still next door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I remember when I saw him stand up, I was like, oh, there's Henry Primo. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and yes. he was deal back then i mean i think oh, even yeah. bigger even bigger back then he was yeah kind of like the car king yes he used to have a huge picture of tom hanging up in the uh, in the lobby of the bmw dealership because you could drive by and look in there and see tom up on the wall so i actually asked asked him about that picture not too long ago i think it was actually at the circle cinema it's like hey whatever happened to that picture and I think he sold it. Somebody offered him a lot of money for that picture. So, Oh, wow. And <clears throat> so let's kind of talk about the bent fight because I remember seeing things like everyone was in shock about what happened, you know? And yeah. That was kind of crazy. Um, you know, in the... <laughs> I think he thought it was just going to be an easy fight. He was going to go in there and knock out this guy and, you know, give the hometown crowd a good show. And uh, Michael Bent just caught him with a good, you know, good shot. And, you know, these big guys, you know, it irritates me when people say, oh, he had a, a, a glass chin. You know, you get in there with these 225-pound men and get hit and see, you know, See if it knocks you down. So, um, anyway, it, it was shocking. I mean, I remember going back to the dressing room after that fight and 
I really didn't know what to say to him. He was just kind of standing in the corner with his head down, just, you know, I think he was in shock too. So that was, that was kind of a rough night. How devastated was he? He was pretty, pretty devastated. I mean, you know, he had, um, I think they talked about it in the ESPN film. He actually had a contract to fight Lewis in, I think, March of that next year. And it would have been, I think, a seven or eight million dollar payday. And uh, it was, you know, that was just gone. So uh, he was pretty devastated over it. But, you know, looking back, I remember thinking, you know, had he hmm. gone on and fought Lewis for seven or eight million dollars, you know, what would have happened? You know, I mean, that's a lot of money. You know, right. it's just, you know, maybe he would have deteriorated faster. I don't know. So, I to me, it was kind of a blessing in disguise, you know, that he didn't go on and make that big money. Now, when he fought Ben, do you think that? Was that part of what kind of made him go down some? Um, maybe a little. I mean, that that was pretty early on in 93. Um, you know, he came, by, came back, and I'm trying to think who he fought the next year. Um, Did he fight Razor Brothers before or after Foreman? Uh, that would have been after, I believe. That Amazing. Yeah, it was after. That was an now incredible that, that fight, you know, people always ask me if it got easier to watch him fight. And it's like, no, it gets harder. When mm -hmm. you care about somebody, when someone you love is in that ring, because the longer they're in there, you know, the better the competition. And it gets scary. And um, I remember looking at that man, Razor Reddick, and I was like, that is a big, scary man. And, uh, but I just had to remind myself, you know what, Tom's a big, scary man too. So t I was really stressed out for that fight. But, you know, when he knocked him out, that was, it was amazing. It's like, yes, let's go home. <laughs> so, yeah, it's yeah. from a spectator standpoint, maybe it's, maybe it's greatest fight possible. It was pretty, yeah, it was a pretty amazing fight. Given the opponent, given how the fight went, <clears throat> it was incredible, that fight. Yeah. Yeah, that now, was pretty awesome. When did you, when did he kind of start to have issues? Why do you think he had issues? Um, like when he started going downhill, um, that would have been, can we get that cat off the table, please? That would have been, um, after the HIV announcement, uh, you know, when he lost his boxing license is when things really started going downhill. Uh, we ended up moving to Fayetteville, Arkansas in, um, I think it was January of 98. And that was a huge mistake. Um, that's when he started hanging around people that were, you know, into, into some pretty bad stuff and you know, just idle hands, and he just really went downhill at that point. And so, so it was after, you know, it was in 96 when he started going downhill after he lost his boxing license. So before that, he was still doing pretty good as far as having any issues with going. Yes. Yeah. So and 96 was a pretty rough year. And I remember you said something that I rem that I remember in the interview where you're saying uh, it was more comfortable for you to stay in this kind of chaotic situation rather than go off to the unknown. And I found that interesting because right. I never thought about that before. But that's probably how a lot of women feel that are in maybe some chaotic situations. Yeah. Um, so 96, I mean, that's when the HIV announcement happened. And... Um, you know, that's when I found out about the other Don. And, uh, I mean, it was just like, you know, somebody taking your wife, you know, in a jar and just dumping it out. It's like, here's your wife. 
and now everything's crap. So we're dealing with, you know, the HIV announcement, found out about, you know, the other dawn and just, it was a really rough time. And um, I actually, I actually was going to leave. Um, I, you know, when they told me what was going on between the two of them, I actually drove back to Jay and started packing my things. And his mom actually showed up at the house and it's like, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm leaving because of course everybody else knew what was going on. But, um, she actually talked me into staying. And then, you know, we're dealing with all the HIV issues and him getting retested, me getting tested, um, just so much chaos. And, um, I, uh, I remember he actually asked me one day to call a um, call a hotel in Vegas, call a chapel, let's go get married. And I'm just, you know, I talked about this at, on the film. It's like, you know, all this crap that we're going through, I should be leaving. I should be running as fast as I can. But, you know, we had already been together at that point for about three years. And, um, it's like, well, you know, okay, let's go get married. And I, I honestly thought the other Don would go away. And, you know, if he took care of himself, he'd be healthy. I'd be healthy and life would, you know, be grand. But it uh, didn't turn out that way. So, you know, that's really when things started going downhill it was that year because he did lose his boxing license. Um, he did do some commentating for HBO and, uh, that didn't last long because he got busted for DUIs and, mm -hmm. you know, he was just trying to, I don't know if he was just trying to self-medicate himself, but I mean, he had people sending him all kinds of remedies, you know, do this, do that. And it's, you know, honestly, if he would have just taken care of himself, he would have been fine. Now, it almost seemed like he kind of had a personality where he kind of wanted to gamble his life a little bit. It seemed Yeah, like that. that was him. You know, if you told him he couldn't do something or he shouldn't do something, he was going to damn sure turn around and do it. And, uh, you know, you're asking me about the chaos and me saying I felt better being in the middle of it. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain because, you know, things did get really bad and I should have left a long time ago, but I didn't. And uh, it's, you know, I was thinking about it today. It's like, I honestly felt like if I left, he would die. Um, so, I did. I put myself in harm's way to try to save him. And, uh, you know, I don't really want to talk about abuse and things like that, but I do understand why women stay. I mean, you do, you feel, you know, you feel safer being in the middle of the storm so you can at least see what's happening rather than go over here and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't know. Especially in a situation where maybe you're at a place where maybe you don't know many people. The only person you really are close with is your partner, you know? Yeah. I, I thought what you said made sense. I just never thought of it before. Yeah. <laughs> so it's something that stuck with me. Um, that I, The one kind of thing that stuck with me from all of that, um, you and Tony talking, was that, you know, you weren't allowed to expand on it there because of the time constraint but right i thought it was something interesting to talk about because you know i'm sure people think about the, why does this person do that why does this, but mm -hmm. in some ways the alternative is harder than than staying you know yeah, you know you know when i was married to him i loved him very much and i felt like you know it was i get i don't want to say i felt obligated but you know that was my role. He was my husband and I was going to do my best to take care of him. And, 
you know, I stayed a lot longer than I should have. It, you know, it finally got to the point where, you know, I finally realized if I leave, yeah, he might die or end up in prison. But if I don't leave, you know, what's going to happen to me? So it just, it finally got to that point. And him actually going to prison was my way out because I probably wouldn't have left. You know, sad to say. No, I don't remember what it was. What it was that that he he had to go to prison for? Um, he had actually gotten into a lot of trouble. Um, actually, it was, I believe, it was September of ninety nine. I I had actually gone to Nebraska for my grandmother's funeral, and um, as we were pulling out of the cemetery, one of my friends from here and Jay called me. And it's like, hey, Tom's in jail. He got pulled over in Fayetteville. He had guns in the car, drugs in the car, books on how to make methamphetamine. And uh, so he's sitting in jail. So like, great, you know. Well, um, my family and I, we come back to Oklahoma and I'm heading back to Fayetteville to go home and I stopped at a store to get gas in Salem Springs, Arkansas. And of course they had a Tulsa world newspaper, you know, thing. And there he is on the front page. So, you know, that sucked. Um, got back to Fayetteville, got him out of jail. And then in November, it was actually Thanksgiving day. Uh, by this point, he was just off doing his own thing. And I had gone, or I had come back to Jay to be with my family for Thanksgiving and um, got a call that night that he was in jail and um, found out that he and one of his buddies had totaled the Corvette that he had just bought. Not, you know, I think it was earlier that year that he had bought that, but they totaled the vet, had guns in the car, drugs in the car and uh, had ended up going to jail again. So he had a court date. He had already had a court date set for the first incident that I talked about. And um, then uh, trying to think, he had a court date set for November or December of that year. And at that point is when they were like, you know, you're, you're going to prison. He had already been in so much trouble before and had gone to like rehabs and you know, they gave him the, the choice. You either, you know, you're either going to jail or you're going to rehab. Well, we tried rehab three different times and that didn't work out. So he ended up going to jail at that point. Yeah, it must have been hard for him because he was no longer Tommy Morrison, you know. In yeah. A so. Yeah. The highs of that lie and now it's gone. It must have been difficult for him to you know, experience that. Yeah, you know, and I'm glad you kind of brought that up because I've read things and I've heard things over the years of how his, you know, people say, well, his friends just left him. He was no longer, you know, Tommy Morrison and his friends just bailed on him. Well, no, they didn't. You know, the people who were truly his friends and loved him and still love him today, they did not bail on him. Um, you know, things were bad and it, it was really hard to be around him at times. And, you know, some of these people have families and little kids and, you know, he was doing things that you wouldn't want around your family. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, his whole personality changed too. So it was, you know, he wasn't a joy to be around anymore. And um, so, you know, that always bothered me when people said his, his friends bailed on him because they didn't bail on him. But, I mean, his life, the boxer, Tommy Moore, yeah. he wasn't that person anymore, and that must have been hard, you know, because yeah. that, that's hard for entertainers, you know, whoever it is, the boxer, celebrities, yeah, or whatever. So that, yeah. I assume that was probably difficult for him. Yeah, I'm sure it was, and, you know, <clears throat> Looking back, I was probably a lot more naive than I thought I was, but, um, 
you know, I mean, I have my regrets. I wish, I wish I could have asked him, you know, like, what can I do to help you so that you were not going down this path? But, you know, I was pretty young at that point. Was, like, I think I was 24 when we got married. So, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Now let's kind of talk about his kids. Cause I know I've seen some pictures of you with Trey and, uh, I forgot what the other brother's Kinsey. name is. Kinsey? Yeah. Yeah, Kinsey. You're still, you're close with them. Oh, yeah. You know, when Tom and I first got together, they were just little boys. And, of course, I've known both of them since they were born and uh, loved them both very much. And, uh, you know, both of them being in the boxing ring is pretty, you know, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's, uh, I lost touch with them for a while it's kind of my own doing when tom and i split up i just kind of you know kept myself out of that picture just so i could move on and uh, i didn't see trey or kenzie i think they were probably maybe seven or eight years old the last time i saw them before you know they were adults and i got back in touch with them so uh when tom passed away I actually saw Trey at Buffalo Run Casino and uh, we talked for a while and he that's when he actually asked me what I thought about him boxing because he was thinking about starting to fight professionally. So, you know, we talked about that. And, you know, both boys fighting is just, you know, it's, I can't even put it into words. It's, it's scary, but it's exciting and you know, really proud of both of them. And I hate it that their dad isn't here to see them do this because I think he'd be really proud of them. Right. And I, I wish I would have asked Tony because I was kind of curious, you know, his experience with Tom. I was a little surprised he would be encouraging of uh, his, his kids to box. You right. Know? But it seems like he's pretty supportive of it. Yes, and you know, Tony actually got out of boxing, um, I think it was around 99, because that's when Randy Carver died, you know, he, he had, um, he was in a fight, and they ended up taking him to the hospital, and he just passed away, well, that's when Tony got out of boxing, and um, I believe he said he was never going to you know, he wouldn't do it again. And then here comes Trey, you know, asking him for help. And um, Tony told him no at first. And I think it was a few days later, he called him up and was like, you know, if you're going to do this, I'm going to help you. So, and I actually told Trey that night, he asked me about, you know, what I thought about him fighting. And I was like, well, listen, you know, use your dad as an, as an example of what not to do. And listen to Tony, because he will not do you wrong. So, you know, and that's been really exciting, watching the boys fight. And because I've gotten back in touch with all the Morrisons and, you know, just seeing everybody again and being at the fights is pretty great. It's almost like therapeutic because of yeah. what might have been. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, when... Kinsey looked so much like his dad when Tom, you know, when he was in high school. And there was one night at Buffalo Run, <clears throat> Kinsey had not gotten in the ring yet, and I had gone back to the bar to get a drink. So I was, you know, a good 150 feet away from the ring. Kinsey got in there, and I looked up, and I took a step back because it looked like Tom standing in the ring. And that was, you know, that was pretty amazing. And so... It's just been really great watching them fight. And do they do now when they were little, were they living with the two of you when you were out living in Grand Lake or wherever? No, they didn't live with us, but they came out to visit quite a bit, you know, whenever Tom was home and, you know, not off training somewhere, they would come stay with us. Yeah. So do they lean on you for a lot of advice or, or not? Um, no, they don't really ask me for advice, but, you know, the house I live in now, I've lived here for almost two years now, but when I first moved into this house, um, 
there was a guy mowing the lawn next door, and I looked. He had a hoodie on. And I was like, man, that's like Kinsey. And I knew his girlfriend's dad lived next door to me. It's like, son of a gun, it is Kinsey. Well, Kinsey was actually living next door, so they um, we got to be neighbors for quite a while. So his little boy come, you know, would come over and hang out quite a bit. So we got to spend a lot of time together over the last, you know, that year and a half that they lived over here. So, you know, and Trey comes over. And so I haven't got to see Trey in a while, but, you know, it's fun being around them because they do act like their dad. And um, it's kind of funny. They were here one night and, uh, like brothers, they were kind of bickering around, not fighting, but just, you know, being ornery with each other. And I was like, oh, my God, it's like having Tommy Morrison in my house again. But there's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you, when they have fights, do you plan to go to most or all of them or no? I go to as many as I can. You know, when Trey fights off, you know, somewhere I'm not able to. But if they fight around here, I, I do my best to make it. And so, so you're kind of, you think that that's something you're going to be a part of going forward for however long they do it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, they're not my children, but, you know, they're my boys and um, I will always be supportive of them. So, yeah, I'll now be there I, if I can be. <laughs> now, I know as we're winding this interview down, I know you got to get back to your daughter. And stuff, but, <laughs> you know, I always like to let uh, the person I'm talking to maybe leave the interview or something for people that are watching this or whatever you think might, something you might want to say at the end. Um, just, you know, one of the things about Tom, you know, things always go towards the HIV and his demise and everything, but, you know, something that I would love for people to know about Tom was he had such a huge heart. He was very generous. He was so much fun. I mean, you know, before things got bad, you know, my jaws would hurt from laughing and smiling because he was just always doing something stupid to make you laugh and, you know, just would do anything. And uh, he was just a lot of fun to be around. And, uh, you know, he just, he just had too many demons he was fighting, but he was a very kind hearted person. And, um, you know, one of my friends here in Jay who knew him pretty well said, you know, with Tom, you either love to hate him or you hated to love him. And I think that was perfect. So. <clears throat> well, I want to really thank you for taking the time to do this. I know it wasn't easy for you to do it because I'm kind of a little nervous about it. But yeah. like, <laughs> I thought you did a great job at Circle Cinema, you know. And I well, wish, thank you. You know, you and Tony only had a short period of time. And uh, I wish you would have had time to maybe elaborate on some of the things you said so I'm really grateful that you took the time to do this you know obviously okay. I couldn't You're do welcome. this enough, you know but uh, I'm very thankful that you did it and uh, <clears throat> if you ever want to catch up again or something uh, that, that'd be great too yeah so, absolutely so I want to thank thank you for uh, coming on and uh, it was just really interesting to hear your perspectives of Tom and I know there's a lot of people who probably didn't get to hear these perspectives at Circle Cinema <laughs> And uh, yeah. I think it's important. So you're welcome. I appreciate you having me on here. It's you know, it's, yes, I was nervous, but it turned out better than I than I thought. And sorry, my daughter interrupted a few times. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> cool. You know, so yeah. I, <laughs> well, it was great talking to you, and I hope you have a great night, and uh, that you kind of survived this winter weather we're all battling right now. Yeah. Thank you, Todd. You take care. Have a great night. You too. That was great talking to you. You too. Bye-bye.